So, uh, so welcome, the first event of Global Surgery Amsterdam. We started off about a year ago with uh, five young physicians, among um, which I am one, working in surgery and plastic surgery in, in Amsterdam. And we all have a big passion for surgery in, in low and middle income countries. We started off collecting a big group of people around us, uh, our faculty of specialists, uh, our trainees, young researchers and, and physicians, uh, our advisory board, and now also a nice group that helped us organize this symposium. The mission of Global Surgery Amsterdam is to initiate, facilitate and collaborate. Those are important points in order to improve global surgical care by research, education and training. And at the moment, research is actually our main um, focus. So today we're focusing on one of the big uh, one of the main focuses of global surgery, which is training methods. Uh, you will hear very interesting talks from people from all over the world, different countries, about on-the-job methods, off-the-job methods, and also we have some personal stories from, from the field. I want to talk to you about COSEXA. COSEXA stands for the College of Surgeons, East, Central, Southern Africa. Our mission for the future, this is Kenya. I'm just going to take one more minute on Kenya, 47 counties, we have 257 district hospitals. I plan to train 771 surgeons in the next 10 years so that there'll be three surgeons at each district hospital. 771, you need 77 per year. These are the numbers we are training and we need to convince 10% of the doctors coming out to take up surgery. That's another important task. Our challenges, funding is always a challenge. More improvement of the hospitals from the government. We're working on this and it's moving because in Kenya there are counties and each governor is concerned about his county. So these are some of the problems, but we need more passionate champions like you in the, in, in, in the room. Actually, Global Surgery Amsterdam was um, created with a thought that research is something that is really missing. We have here a culture that all young doctors, they're really interested to do research, but uh, most of the doctors there, they are so enormously busy with the clinical work and the culture of doing research was not yet there. So we wanted to try to build a partnerships with the local doctors, the local students there, to see if we can do some research together. So the first of them is Nathan Beineveld. 95%. This number reflects the percentage of burn injuries that occur in low and middle income countries. Over 200,000 people die every year due to burns. Research on surgical burn care in Sub-Saharan Africa is scarce and the quality is very low. There's a lot of missing data and there's no uh, systematic way of describing their data. Together with uh, Matthijs Botman and Tom Hendricks, we conducted this review on short-term reconstructive surgical missions in low and middle income countries. So the key aspects of our review, we found 41 eligible studies. We focused on four main outcomes, uh, basic patient characteristics, patient safety, patient safety with regards to complication rates, uh, health gains and sustainability. And uh, what we did find is there is a correlation between sustainable missions um, and their, uh, their follow-up. So longer uh, follow-up means a better sustainable, uh, better rate of sustainability. Hello everybody, my name is Anna and this is Fleur. And well, our research project is about the current role of surgical missions in low and middle income countries. Um, the current situation is that many surgical missions are performed on global scale. Annually, uh, 313 million US dollars is spent on surgical missions, mostly performed by NGOs. And a part of these missions uh, focus on reconstructive conditions. Um, but the problem is little is known in the literature about the strategies of these missions. And uh, besides, we uh, searched websites and annual reports uh, of the NGOs, which showed us heterogeneity in the public available data. So there is a knowledge gap in goal of mission, follow-up, evaluation, training and research. Um, we conducted a pilot study in three organizations, Kappacare, Interplast the Netherlands and Doctors of the World the Netherlands. Um, this pilot study uh, revealed us interesting differences between these organizations, namely aim of the mission and change in approach in the past years and the reasons why for this. After this pilot, the next step in our research will be that we will develop the medical mission survey further in collaboration with ICOPLAST and that we're working on a second questionnaire for uh, the ministries of health in the low middle income countries. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Joost Binnert and uh, 
with Matthijs and Tom Hendricks. I'm involved in a study into the feasibility of post-burn contracture surgery in Sub-Saharan Africa. Two missions have passed, during which 34 patients uh, with a grand total of 84 joint contractures have been treated. The primary outcome measures, like changes in range of motion, uh, have yet to be analyzed. Uh, so all I can show you for now is what 24 patients have told us three months post-operatively. So before surgery, uh, they graded their distress uh, a 6.3, with 10 being the worst possible score. Um, three months post-operatively, though, uh, the average distress score had dropped to 1.1 only. Like this girl who suffered this burn injury when she was only one years old and grew up with uh, using just her left arm. She was treated during our last mission and faithfully returned for her follow-up uh, to demonstrate her progress, which we will show here. Now to translate that into data. Thank you for your attention. Um, on behalf of all of these organizations here and all of the people, I wanted to present our project. It's called the Pediatric Burns Outcomes Collaborative. The primary outcome we'll be measuring will be in hospital mortality, and secondary outcomes will be etiology of burns and surgical medical management. Yeah, my name is uh, Jure van Kester. I'm a resident general uh, surgery, and this is uh, a photo I took in uh, Sierra Leone. Um, and I'm setting up a research project on video assisted learning on a surgical residency program in a low resource setting. Um, so I, I was wondering, is it possible to check uh, how somebody is performing? Can we document how somebody is doing a surgical procedure? So I went back to the hospital in Sierra Leone. We made this uh, set up. And actually on a very low um, cost, uh, we developed, after a lot of trial and error, videos that have these kind of clear images. Our idea now is to analyze these recordings to make baseline videos of the surgeons that are in training in the project that I worked before, expose them to a uh, platform that offers a uh, uh, video assisted learning, and then afterwards we will uh, check how they have improved or how they have uh, used this, um, this project. The second project that I'm working on together with uh, Matthijs and uh, Jochen Bretsneider from Medical Learning Experience is uh, Library of Global Surgery. 70 organizations signed in 2014 um, that essential surgical care should be put on the agenda. And with essential surgical care, they actually meant 15 to 16 surgical conditions that account for around 80% of the surgical burden. So what we have done now is that we said, okay, these 15, 16 medical conditions, let's put them into an electronic environment. Let's put them in an e-book. And initially we start with the iBook together with medical learn experience. Um, and we use the concept of one world, one standard of care. We use the international guidelines as a base for these books. And we adjust the books on modern times. So we involve, uh, we, we input um, video learning into this project. The surgical missions we do from Doctors of the World, we do it already since 1989, 98. Um, and the main thing when we started it, it was mainly focusing on providing care to vulnerable groups and do some training on the job. That's it. What we now did, especially after the Amsterdam Declaration, to focus on access to essential surgery care in low middle income countries. So we tried to see if we could scale it up instead of just focusing on providing care, providing surgery. So Kappa Care is an NGO, completely uh, independent. We have made uh, uh, partnerships with uh, a lot of different hospitals, governmental, private uh, hospitals, where we are allowed to train uh, people. And then we are, have financial support from uh, the UN and from uh, NORA, this is a Norwegian one. And then we have an academic uh, part. The center of our intention is the Ministry of Health. They need to be in, in uh, charge of this. So this is the concept that we have, we have been uh, developing. Um, Interplus Holland is one of the oldest organizations sending missions to uh, uh, especially uh, Africa. Um, we started it in 89 and we started this organization as a part of a very independent part of the big Interplus family. 
We are a non-profit organization. We have no money. We only get money by uh, donors. Uh, we are a little bit different in the way that uh, surgery for us is important, but training and especially of the uh, structures that support uh, surgery is even more important for us. I was triggered by the uh, uh, statement that says local actors need to be in control. Have you considered this aspect of how, how local actors and local systems can be in control of the work that uh, you uh, perform from the, from the perspective of doctors of the world? One of you mentioned, what, what should you do? Should you operate or should you train? Uh, we have a very clear priority. Training comes first, uh, operation comes second. Your um, statement on um, the complications that, that uh, do arise during a mission, uh, don't leave them for the local uh, colleagues. Um, how do you organize that? Well, first of all, you need to start to record what is uh, happening with your patients and, uh, and uh, two or three days observation time. Uh, or we have, everybody knows that short observation times give you good outcomes. In our situation, most of the time we have our patients pre-selected by the local doctor so they know what they uh, are going to operate. We do a selection of the, uh, of the patients the first uh, day, and after that we make a program where the procedures which have the highest complicated rate, and you know that after being there, we start, we, we do them first, and we end always with the uh, 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 operations where there is a very low complication rate. How do you measure the outcome of your surgery? Because I have doubt you do. We cannot measure. Because um, we operate most of the time in uh, uh, rural areas, very remote from the capital. People have to drive uh, with uh, local transport one or two days to go to the, to the hospital. And when they are treated and they are fine, they go back home and they don't come back and nobody is seeing these patients uh, That's afterwards. a huge drawback of no, your policy. Local That's doctors, a huge drawback, I can tell you, because most teams make more complications than they think they are making. My name is Sister Avelina Temba, um, a surgeon in Korogwe District Hospital. So I treat not only general surgery, but I also treat urology cases, uh, gynecology, obs obstetric, pediatric, reconstructive surgery. But I refer some of the cases in the referral hospital, which are in KCMC, Moshi, and Dar es Salaam. I refer ENTI and uh, some of orthopedic cases. Uh, <clears throat> I face some challenges on my work, especially I don't have other specialists to discuss about some of the cases, and I have little time for studying because of working in two different hospitals and having many patients. I lack some of uh, surgical equipment, and I don't have supervision and intervention with uh, other specialists and professors in my hospital. I came to Ethiopia the first time with my family in 1987, and I haven't yet got any return ticket, so I'm still in Ethiopia. <laughs> I was the only doctor at that time I arrived with very limited experience from Norway. But as a doctor coming to help Ethiopia, I should master everything. So I started also with burns, and I got a hambi knife in my hand, and I just had to start, but I failed time and again it was so difficult there was no one to ask for help seemingly until there was one working in the same OR and help assistant that were just assisting on operations he had one year training from school so the first experience of training in Ethiopia was when the health assistant looking at me finally said doctor shall I help you my name is Tom Gesnicht. I'm a global health doctor from Holland and uh, be in my surgical residency here in Holland. And I've been working in Masanga, Sierra Leone, where of you've heard about before, and uh, where we train surgical uh, 
yeah, CHOs, health officers in uh, surgical skills. I've been working uh, three and a half years in Africa, uh, mainly in Sierra Leone for two years, and also in Ethiopia and in Gabon. I've been uh, in Ethiopia in uh, different varieties. I've been in surgical missions, in, in plastic surgery, in uh, cleft, cleft missions twice. And in Sierra Leone, I've been hosting a mission, so I've been seeing missions a bit from both sides. And uh, here we operate at 100 clefts in, uh, in a week. The thing is, what I want to, to highlight also is um, our Western doctors, if they go for missions, not a drop on a, on a hot plate. This is Africa in 100 years, the forecasted population growth. All the continents are kind of stable, except Africa, which rises uh, very fast. So if we go operating cleft lips next year, there are only more. So it doesn't make sense. But are we, as Western doctors, if we go to, to Africa for, for a short time, are we going to be still prepared to work there? With the laparoscopy, the robotic surgery coming, are we still going to be able to, to deal with that? Like, does it still make sense to go there for, for short missions or short stays? Or should we go like Einar for 20 years or like Albert Schweitzer for 60 years? Um, in, the last, in the last presentation, we had the uh, provocative statement that uh, short-term missions can be disturbing to uh, local hospitals. And uh, Sister Dr. Tembo, Tembo can you re uh, react to that uh, statement? Uh, local missions are very important and very good. Although they really sometimes disturb the system, when I go to Haidom, two weeks, and when I go back to my hospital, it's very good, I present, I become very new, very active with a uh, high knowledge. So I really like uh, for this mission for the doctors to come and attend at our hospitals. It's very good. You said that there's a lot of MDs who are trained in Africa or wherever. Uh, they go abroad to high income countries. Um, I'm just, I've heard this as well, but I was wondering if you know maybe how big this problem is or uh, if you have any experience with this? Um, from our perspective, dealing with, with uh, burns and wounds, uh, there are not that many surgeons that are, are, are lining up because they want to learn more how to treat them. But there are many, many others, and I mentioned the, the clinical health officers that are trained, quite a number of them in Ethiopia. Uh, they, they are eager to learn. We have trained one, as I mentioned, only for four months. And a second one from the same hospital has already started um, uh, training. So we need to focus on others than general surgeons. And general surgeons who stay in Ethiopia, they, have, they are also overwhelmed with, with clinical problems. There's no question about that. So in a hospital uh, down south Ethi in Ethiopia where we, we have a focus, there's only one general surgeon for an area of, let's say, two million people or three million people. So th that is what we talk about, and, and so we need to focus on others that are not general surgeons. We think that nowadays uh, uh, the way we learn has changed uh, immensely uh, um, in, fa in the last few years. So uh, um, interactive technologies have been a, a greater part of our lives, and especially the mobile phones. And mobile phones is something that we see also in the low and middle income countries. Uh, people there probably don't have electricity, they don't have a personal computer, but they probably have a, a 4G phone uh, with a 12 megapixel camera, uh, which helps us actually to uh, use that platform that they already have to, uh, um, to create something new. Our last project that we've started, uh, that we finished is a quite large project where we created um, uh, over 100 iBooks that encompass actually everything that you need to know as a medical doctor in the Netherlands. So that's around 1,200 different diagnoses. And we really think that mobile technology is the way forward, especially for uh, uh, low and middle income countries. Everyone already has that phone, so why, why, why might as well use that phone for, for, uh, for the, yeah, teaching each other and also teaching yourself uh, and keeping yourself updated? Fundamentally, training in surgery is hard. All right. Uh, and making surgeons takes a long time, right? Um, and firsthand, when myself and my colleague Andre experienced the variability that exists in surgery, um, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about how can we structure surgery and surgical process. 
uh, and then just make, make it really accessible. All right. Um, in doing so, we have spent the first five years building a company which is about 200 or so people, uh, raised over $50 million, based between New York, San Francisco, and London, to train surgeons through a free-to-access app called Touch Surgery. Um, and now, we've actually started to train computers to do surgical procedures. This is Touch Surgery. It's a free-to-download app. Um, it's been available for about five years, over two million users now. Step-by-step um, -step surgical procedures on your phone, um, over 150 or so, and increasing. Um, you know, surgeons uh, use this to firstly train. So you get all the cues, instructions, and then we remove the cues and you can assess yourself. So where we're going? Into the operating room. One day, we don't think you'll need a screen in the OR. We think actually you'll be able to deploy this information into an augmented reality setting. You'll see there's a fracture, and then this essentially will walk someone through exactly how to do the procedure. Uh, for the ones who do not know Incision, I have uh, an overview of what we do. We are an online uh, platform with uh, e-learning courses for, educational, uh, for the education of students, uh, interns, residents, and even surgeons. 300 online courses, uh, and this is what one uh, course looks like online. We have a 2D and 3D version of a uh, uh, procedure. Uh, combined with the step-by-step -step of that procedure. Today, I think we all heard that uh, there is a shortage in surgical capacity and it takes money and time to educate uh, all these people. Um, and that we need more quality. The quality differs a lot. Um, there's a lot of medical publications. Each five year, the number of publications doubles. It's impossible to keep track on that. Besides that, uh, there's a lack of standardization in healthcare, uh, we think. Standardization helps to understand the procedure, to perform it in the correct uh, way that is evidence-based, and uh, it reduces the, uh, the amount of errors and increases patient safety. And when you have a standardization, it can not only be for uh, the professional, the, the, the specialist, but also for the whole team, like a scrub nurse, for example, when she speaks, uh, he uh, speaks the same language, uh, there's a chance that the, uh, the errors will uh, reduce during the procedure, so it increases patient safety. So for these challenges, Incision uh, tries to find solutions, and these are the three things that we think uh, can uh, help. Uh, the first one being evidence-based knowledge. The, the second one, uh, what our solution is in uh, increasing the manpower, and the third one, standardization. This is really a big opportunity towards a new way of learning. But I also have a point of, of, of critic criticism, because I think doing a surgical job is not doing just a trick. And if I might say so, this is learning a trick. How do you implement also learning how to make your indication for surgery? I don't uh, believe by any means that you can just go through an operation and then become a surgeon on a phone. Uh, it's a contribution to your learning curve, but you know, another part is the indication, the diagnosis, but also the communication how do you behave with your team, the culture, like lots of other things. With the uh, Library of Global Surgery, we want to try to incorporate um, international guidelines, but also, let's say, a recommendation. Uh, and also, for instance, uh, what is evidence-based? Um, uh, what are the experiences of the field? That are things that we want to integrate in the books as well. And we hope to, do, uh, to make it... Um, easy accessible. In other words, that if you are, let's say, uh, on the bedside and you have uh, on your iPad or on your phone and you say, oh, mm, I think this is maybe a, uh, a hernia, but it's, I don't know if it's indirect or indirect, uh, let me go to check the references and then we want to make it that you can access it very quickly. And I hope that with these books we can try to make the indication, uh, of making the indication for a surgery uh, more, uh, more easier for people to use. Yeah. Your techniques are mainly based on recognizing images. And that is the last thing a plastic surgeon should do. We created actually a special course that's not available online, but it's on clinical decision making, where we actually take 
um, a, ca a case, a clinical case, uh, can be a surgery, but can be also, let's say, internal medicine. Then we go all the way from A to Z, a to, Z to, uh, okay, for instance, the patient tells this story. What are the highlights? What are the important things in that story? And then you can check yourself. Is that correct or not? And then you go to the next phase. Let's say uh, physical examination. What are the key points that you need to look at? And then in that way, you can test yourself, and you also think like a doctor while going through a case instead of just learning a procedure or just learning the thing you actually have to critically think about what you're doing and I think that iBooks are really uh, good for that because you have an interactivity you can check yourself and you can also um, straight away see the results after you uh, uh, have read the, the piece uh, for instance so I think there is probably there is a there is a place for for critical uh, for uh, clinical decision making as well yeah. yeah we are here to talk about global surgery and most of what you explained now is more applicable on the high income uh, situation. So what do your organizations do to, um, uh, to bridge this gap and to really focus and make it available for the people that are working on the boats in uh, Bangladesh or in the small rural hospitals in Tanzania, for example? Good question. So, look, I think you have to look at what's happened in the last five to 10 years, right? So more and more places are, have access to internet. Connectivity is increasing. Mobile phone penetration is increasing, right? So we took a decision very early on to build for mobile. Secondly, we made a very early decision to make touch surgery free, right? It is free to access for everyone. Uh, the reason being is we didn't want to introduce a barrier to adoption to a tool that we believed could train people and maybe impact patient outcomes. And the result of that is we have over a thousand or so users in, in really remote areas. Uh, uh, I think the way we are uh, helping uh, um, in the lower research setting is that uh, more, more on the content sides, uh, we make decisions uh, based on uh, curriculums uh, from other countries uh, but also, uh, and we make choices not only for the Western world. And an example for that is that we have did procedures on the craniotomy and the burr holes, not uh, necessary for uh, uh, the general sur uh, surgical residents here in the Netherlands, but we create also these kind of procedures and a lot of open procedures, not only robotic and laparoscopic, but a lot of open procedures to provide in the needs. We've spoken about general surgery. Uh, Sister Avelina showed what she does. The, the practice that she has, I don't think there's any surgeon in the Netherlands who could run that practice. And this is also a problem that we have here in the Netherlands and other Western countries, uh, the discussion about general surgery. We all feel that uh, differentiating, subspecializing is the best we can do for our patients. I disagree, as a matter of fact, because our patients are not undifferentiated. When they come into the emergency room, they often are undifferentiated. They don't have a sticker on their forehead, what they have. So I believe that we still have to train as uh, general surgeons, as general medical doctors, and maintain that general skill. Don't lose it. This is our basis. And of course, we can be subspecialized, but don't uh, claim that you've forgotten about all the other parts of your domain. Well, and in the Netherlands, uh, the model for training is a, used to be a competency-based training uh, introduced by Richard Rasnick from uh, Toronto. So is competency-based training, is that truly the solution? Well, we don't believe so because the individual competencies are important, but it is about a combination of different competencies. And um, Ole ten Kate, who is an educational expert from Utrecht, has uh, introduced uh, EPAs and trustable professional activities. And it's uh, basically a combination of different competencies, a more holistic approach to the workplace. For instance, managing a patient with appendicitis, going from medical history, physical examination, to management, to handling the post-operative complications. So have we solved the problem? Are the EPAs, subspecialization, are those the holy grail? Well, absolutely not. Let's take a look at how long it takes to train a medical specialist. It takes about 14 to 18 years. Uh, the cost is one to two million euros. So that is extremely long. 
please mention any other profession, any other, any other specialty that takes 14 years to train. We need to develop a new way of learning. And we need to sit down uh, with each other and try to identify the elements of surgical training. And I've just written down a few over here, and you can read them for yourself. And when you look them over, and when you consider which are the truly uh, manual skills, it's only motor skills. All the other skills are skills of the eye, they're cognitive, cognitive competencies. Surgeries for 95% is brains, and for 5% is hands. So we should train much more the brain than train the hands. And all the, uh, all the attention that goes to the robotic systems, which are all telemanipulators, not the robotic systems, uh, I think is a little bit over the top because it's about recognizing images, recognizing anatomic landmarks, uh, spatial uh, relationships. That's what the surgery is about, not the really funky uh, little instrument. If you're a good surgeon, you can work with very simple instruments. <laughs> When we started the first hospital ships in Bangladesh, I had never been inside a hospital in my life. And I wanted to take this ship and go to areas where people had never even seen a doctor in their life. What we discovered was there were just no doctors. So I started, I, I took it on very practically. How do we reach everyone? How do we give care to as many people as we can? Where do we say, no, we can't do more than this? What we did was, we call it the tier three, which is the community. We worked with the community people so that they could do, do certain level of primary care because we found that 80%, 90% of the people were just basically suffering from primary health care. Then we went to the next level. What they couldn't do would go up to the secondary tier, which was the satellite clinics manned by paramedics or uh, medical assistants. And what they couldn't do that went to the doctors. Usually the doctors or the medical teams which are coming to our ships, we know this about a year ahead. And we do our plan of the ship, the movements, the work according to those medical teams coming in. So we do all the screenings, we've got VSATs so we can actually have some doctor uh, a patient consultations also beforehand if needed. And we screen the patients, we keep the patients so that the doctors can come and immediately they're put to work. So they work throughout the seven days or 10 days and they go. And what they have left behind is incredible. Because everyone here knows, because every, so many of you are surgeons, so many of you are doctors, that you don't have to measure the impact of a child who can't walk and can run now. One change is a change of a community, change of a family. And that is how I measure the importance of having surgical intervention in these hard to reach areas. Thank you. <laughs>